Okay, welcome to this lesson on the science of belief. And we'll also talk about the difference between knowledge and wisdom, as well as the skillful use of speech, all in the context of mental fitness and looking at some of the neuroscience. So starting at just a simple question of like, where do beliefs actually come from? And if you trace it back, beliefs must have come from some thoughts. And where do those thoughts come from? Well, they came from concepts, language, naming of things that we learned how to say. And where did those come from? But from perceptions, ultimately from our sensory organs, like our eyes, our ears, and our touch and so forth, as well as our memories. So in the neuroscience theory we've been discussing called predictive processing, beliefs are predictions in the brain. They're layers that help us predict how to operate in a very complex world. And they affect other layers of the brain, so they might affect even what we perceive, such as in the placebo effect where our belief that a pill might make us subjectively experience less pain. And so there's kind of this two-way street between the things that we experience impact our beliefs. Like if I read something in a book, all those little black squiggles that turn into words, which turn into thoughts and ideas in my mind might create a belief like, yeah, that's how it works. That's how the world works. And then vice versa, what I believe is going to impact what I see. So beliefs are so far removed from reality in the sense of raw sensory information that in some sense they all belong in the fiction category. They're like, they're like dreams. But that's not to say they don't have their use. We can't help but living with beliefs and, and inside of beliefs. In fact, there's this little story that I love from the suttas, from the Pali Canon, where a meditator comes to the historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, and says, Mr. Gautama, this is my doctrine and view. Nothing is acceptable to me. He replies, this view of yours a jivasana, is that acceptable to you? And I love this because even somebody who might claim, like, I don't have any beliefs, you know, I'm completely objective. Well, then is that your belief, you know? And often our beliefs are subconscious. So it could be just a belief that, you know, everything is matter, everything is made from atoms, and it will, you know, whatever, whatever it is that we're operating out of, the belief system might have be so ingrained in us and such a part of how we see the world that we don't even realize it's a belief, that it's, it can't be objective. There's also kind of this ingrained evolutionary response that can be maladaptive where our beliefs become very emotional. They become part of our identity. And there was an interesting study in 2016 published in Nature by Kaplan et al. that found that there was an increased activity in the default mode network, a connection of brain regions that are associated with the sense of self when political beliefs were challenged. And for those in this study that were able to, to change their opinions based on counter evidence, there was less activity in their emotional centers when they were reading the counter evidence. So there's this sense that the more emotional we are about our beliefs, the more it becomes like who I am more so than I'm trying to figure out how the world works, the less likely we are to update them and to truly be open-minded to change our beliefs and have them help us create better maps of the world. So this brings us to the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Now, knowledge is, these are facts, these are concepts that we can read on the internet, like Google has a ton of knowledge. Artificial intelligence can answer a lot of our questions, and we can learn a lot of these things in books. But wisdom is more about experience. It's about the direct experience of the human condition and how to view that in a way that's helpful, that leads to our well being. Some of the things you've been learning in this course, like sublime states of mind, metta, compassion, delight and equanimity, as well as jhana, and these deeper states of mind are kind of 
in some sense beyond words. I mean, we can describe them, but it's a, it's a direct experience, and it helps you see deeper layers of the mind. You know, you could come out of that state and try to tell someone, "Oh, this is what I saw, and and this is what it means for for life." And but if they haven't had that experience, then their life won't be changed in the same way because your your wisdom was a direct experience of what you noticed for yourself. In fact, many of the wisdom traditions talk about how thoughts can get in our own ways because we come, become so certain that we know how it is, but we kind of operate out of this knowledge that builds a, a strong sense of self and strong beliefs that prevent us from seeing closer towards the actual present moment of what's happening in our direct experience. So mental fitness isn't about having all the right ideas. It's not about being a, a smart or a well-read or, or learned person. It means having wisdom about how your experience unfolds and how that can lead to your well-being, towards your well-being, or away from it, depending on the choices that you make. And I think also part of this is is having a humility of the limits of conceptual knowledge. Socrates was said to be the wisest man in Greece because he, he said, I know that I know nothing. And he was able to see through his thoughts as, as mere thoughts, as just concepts in his mind. And the Christian Bible likewise says in, in Proverbs 12, 27 to 28, says, quote, the wise say very little and those with understanding stay calm. This is similar to what's said in the Buddhist tradition. Siddhartha Gautama said, a mendicant whose mind is freed like this doesn't side with anyone or dispute with anyone. They use the language of the world to communicate without getting stuck on it. So going back to Ajivasana who came and said, you know, my view is that nothing's acceptable to me. Like, you know, they have no views. And the Buddha had said, is that view acceptable to you? And then he goes on to just point out, like, look in your direct experience and notice how all these different aspects are impermanent and they're not you. And he goes on to explain dependent origination, which we've discussed previously in the course. So in other words, directing this meditator to look at their direct experience and see how it's unfolding. And this, in a sense, I think is the, the use of beliefs and thoughts and words is to actually direct the mind as a tool for how to view reality as, as a kind of instruction on how to meditate. So language is used to communicate without getting stuck on it. In other words, there's this understanding, this wisdom that the words are just words used to help others or to help ourselves, but they're no more than that. They're not worth fighting over. They're not worth arguing about. They're just words. So in the same way that thoughts and language are useful for telling us, you know, how to act, kind of drawing maps of the world and how it works and, and then telling us like how to practice, beliefs can also be useful in this way. Like, I have a belief in Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha, and what he taught, because uh, I've followed his teachings to some extent and gotten results that show me, okay, this is, this is a good path. So those beliefs are, are useful. They've, pro they've proven useful, and it's not something to cling to or to get worked out up about or to debate somebody about. It's more of a understanding or a view that leads towards mental fitness, that leads towards well-being. There was an interesting study on Zen meditators, which found that when they performed a language task compared to the non-meditators, they had less conceptual processing. They were still able to perform this task and, and did just as well on it. So what this seems to suggest, I mean, there's obviously more research needed, but it matches the reports of more advanced meditators that they can still operate 
and function at a high level throughout their day and interact with people and use language, but there might be less conceptual thinking going on throughout the day. They're kind of less caught up in thoughts when they're not useful. And that's a lot of what we've been training in this course is the ability to kind of step out using meta-awareness. So instead of becoming our thoughts and fusing with them, we can use them as tools. There's no need to uh, get rid of our thoughts, but they become more tools, just like beliefs. Instead of beliefs becoming this identity that we need to defend and we need to be right, and then others who are think differently than us become our enemies and we need to fight them. Well, instead we can kind of see through beliefs as these constructions in the mind that are to our benefit. They're they're a useful part of life, but they're not all of life, and they're not the way things have to be. Lastly, I just wanted to share a tool that's been very helpful for me, although it's still something I definitely need to work on. It's a training, and it's an acronym called THINK. T-H-I-N-K. The T stands for timeliness. The H stands for honesty. The I stands for intention. The N is for necessity and the K is for kindness. And this is kind of a quick check on, okay, is what I'm going to say really a useful thing to say? Is this going to be for my own benefit and for the benefit of others? And it's not this idea of trying to be better than others by like only saying, you know, the wise, perfect thing at the perfect time. It's more about just checking in with ourselves and and starting to realize how much of our speech is just kind of to fill the silence or to feel this need to insert ourselves or uphold an opinion or identity. And that much of our speech, it's, it's more skillfully used in a way that can help others. And it also kind of gives us pause to think about the value of what we're going to say and whether it's true. And, and, and so in this way, we create less stickiness in our own minds. We clog up our own minds and we get into less arguments just by being skillful with our speech. Then we can use the four R's to train this throughout the day. So we would recognize this tendency to feel an urge to talk or to insert a kind of opinion or viewpoint. And often this brings with it like a, a, a tension in the body especially if it's a strongly held belief, we might start to feel this emotional reaction in the body, and especially if those beliefs are challenged. So we can recognize this, and then this gives us the chance to pause. We could think about, use the THINK acronym, and if it doesn't check those boxes, then we can release. We can release the urge to say something or act in a way that would cause others or ourselves mental friction, and then we can relish. We can relish in just inner contentment, being comfortable within ourselves. I've never regretted not saying something. I've only regretted saying things. And Siddhartha Gautama advised that we should be as careful about what comes out of our mouths as what goes in them. You know, we often don't think about what we're saying has has heavy consequences towards others and towards ourselves. We might replay it and think about it in our mind for a long time after that. And then the fourth R is to remain. To remain observing with wisdom how things work and remain with less concepts and thoughts and beliefs about how things should work or how we think they work. Thanks for taking the time to listen to all these thoughts and concepts and beliefs that that I hold. And I hope it was somewhat useful for you. I'll see you tomorrow for more mental fitness training.